Hey guys, it's Kat. So before today's episode starts, I wanted to plug my Patreon. By contributing every month, you'll get access to exclusive episodes and creative content. The funding helps me afford new equipment and a better listening experience for you. The link to that Patreon is going to be www.patreon.com slash Wisniewski. I'll leave that link in the description below, but if uninterested, enjoy today's episode. Bye. Test, test, one, two, three. Test, test, one, two, three. Hey guys. Welcome to Brain Food. You can see me visibly now. Sorry. Um, Today's episode three. I mean, bruh. Today's episode four of season three. And um, I just may have had the worst ten minutes of my life. Granted, today I'm two years sober. Yay! Um, Oh my god, you guys can like see my mannerisms now, which is honestly kind of crazy. Um, this is my little setup. This is my little poster. I have um, little lights, little everything. But I've just had the worst 10 minutes of my life. So basically, woke up today at the crisp hour of 7 a.m. Also, y'all, <laughs> I went to take a nap last night at 5.45, woke up at 7 a.m. <laughs> Fully got like 13 hours of sleep. Went to AA this morning. That was great. I had a really great experience today with with my AA because usually it's great. I I go to tell like a little story. I get to talk to some people that I don't usually get to talk to. And it's just a social thing that makes me feel safe. It's a safe space for me to talk about certain stuff that's hard to on here. Um, But basically, I do that. I go and I scan some of my stuff, some of my artwork that I've been working on. I had my whole day planned out. And you know what? It's okay. I'm, I am feel really horrible about what happened <laughs> in the preceding hours. But it's okay. Um, so basically, I get all my stuff done. I just had a therapy appointment that ended like 10, 15 minutes ago. And I was supposed to have a guest today. Like, y'all. I wrote out questions. I printed them out. Communicating with this girl. Everything is going to plan. It's a great day. It's a great day still. And thank God she's understanding enough, but I go to plug in my mic, my second mic. This is my expensive mic, and then my other one is like $10 cheaper, and it's still a good mic. And the fucking mic is broken, and it's not making any sound. Like, every time I go to plug my headphones in, it's like, and I'm like, oh my God. Like, it was 1225. This girl's supposed to be here at my friend Elise, by the way. She's my best friend. (laughs) Um, I'm so sorry, but she was supposed to be here at 1230, and I'm like, oh my god and I'm usually like a very consistent person especially when it comes to scheduling things where I'm like this is at this time this is at this time this is at this time I never cancel and if I do cancel it's 24 hours before dude dude I texted I just texted her five minutes ago like oh my god I'm so sorry like oh my god but it's all right um so today's episode was supposed to be about bipolar and we were going to talk about a lot of stuff. I had a lot of questions. I just talked to my therapist about what we were going to talk about today, but honestly, it's all right. Um, honestly, today's subject is very fitting for what special day this is for me today. So I'm two years sober today. So th- one of the things on my list, and honestly, it's like one of the easiest things that I can talk about and talk freely on is substance abuse. And that was going to be the episode after the one that was supposed to come out today, but it's all right. We're going to talk about substance abuse. I have a lot of stuff written down already and it was one of the first things that I wrote about when I um when I started writing about season three and adding video is a really important part. Um, I just today's a good day. That was a bad moment, but the rest of the day is going to be great. Yay. So today I wanted to talk about substance abuse and that could really go from anything to alcohol, pills, weed, everything and just obsessive behavior in general. Um. I've struggled a lot with that, especially my adolescence, and you guys know that, but because of today and what today is for me, so today I'm going to get my, my, yay, I'm going to get my two, I'm going to get my two-year chip for um, weed and pills because that's what I'm sober from. I won't be sober two years from alcohol until um, May 31st, so today is just weed and al- and weed and pills, which I'll talk about. Um, alcohol, I might leave for a special, just one episode, solo episode, but let's start off. So, um, 
I probably started smoking weed when I was around 14. I remember my first blunt that I smoked. So I've always grown up around older kids. I've always hung out around older kids. Older kids always like, this is fucked up. But like, I remember saying this out loud the other day and someone was like, hmm. and I was like, no, it's supposed to be funny. Older kids would always make me do stupid shit as like, oh, look at, we can make this little kid do. Look what we can make this little 13 year old do. And they're like 16, 17 years old. Like, yo, jump off, whatever. And I would do it because like, I want these older kids to like me. So that's honestly how I started doing drugs was hanging out around kids instead of them telling me to do something stupid. They'd be like, ooh, try this and give me it. So I remember my first blunt. I, my best friend was a year older than me and she threw this open house party and I was so nervous. I remember how nervous I was. I remember I wore a yellow cropped sweatshirt from H&M and then I wore like these ripped black jeans off from Garage. They were my favorite and Converse, black Converse. Girl, I look like a bee, but... (laughs) I went up because I, I up until that point I was drinking a lot like my freshman year of high school that summer going to freshman year of high school I was drinking a lot so drinking I was like I'm gonna get super fucked up I'm gonna get drunk so <laughs> the first time I got high I was I done edibles before that but I'd never smoked weed it didn't really affect me the first time I did edibles and I was like that was that summer so I was July of 2017 holy shit um oh my god I was a freshman in high school in 2018. What the fuck? So technically that was, okay, so that was July of 2018. So these group of kids, like, they were all older too. Like, they were all, like, juniors and sophomores. And I was, like, this freshman. And I was best friends with the girl who's the host of the party. And this group of guys were, like, in a circle. And they were smoking a blunt. And I was, like, I want that. You're the one. Um... I don't want to be hunched over. I'm just going to lay back. So I go up and I, I remember like planning out in my head, like, how am I going to ask? How am I going to ask? Oh my God. Um, but they offered it to me and I was like, oh, I'm in. I'm in. So for y'all who don't avidly smoke weed, I guess, okay, I guess one blunt would obliterate anyone under the age of like 18. <laughs> I smoked a blunt I guess like it was like the majority of the blunt that they were smoking and for a 14 year old who's never smoked weed before like I just remember thinking like oh it's going to be um like alcohol I'm just gonna feel like really drunk and I'm not gonna be able to blah 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 whatever dude I started drinking and then I smoked and then (laughs) I remember taking my shirt off okay this was another thing so because everyone there was a lot older than me I really thought I had to step up my game and honestly like one of the worst things about you know drug addiction is the consequences for the stupid shit that you do when you're under the influence of drugs and alcohol and we talked about it this morning we read from the big book and it was about this story about this guy who His life was spiraling out of control and he was closeted so he was living a double life and he always had bruises on him because he would get fucked up and then he would hurt himself on accident or hurt himself or like fall down a flight of stairs or like where he's just falling because he was so drunk. And I had never heard somebody say that out loud before because it's so true. I remember that night I literally, I walked (laughs) because, I don't want to expose this person but basically her house had burned previously burned down that summer and she was living in like a trailer while they were rebuilding it and I remember that because I'm so tall like I'm six I was probably like six feet tall when I was 14 I think I was like 5'11 six feet the trailers are not very tall in height like you kind of need to uh, like bend down when you go into places and I remember thinking that going in before I was under the influence of anything like "Mm, I'm gonna hit my head on that later when I'm fucked up um so when I got fucked up I ran full force into that door and I had a huge dent on my forehead I remember waking up the next day like where the fuck did I get this from oh that door right there and I would always get hurt when I was under the influence of drugs like physically hurting myself like not on purpose but I would always find a way to severely hurt myself like I had a uh, (laughs) 
I was telling my, this is one of my favorite stories. This is probably the worst I've ever gotten hurt because it is funny, but like looking back on it is really bad. Like genuinely, like this is probably the worst I've ever hurt myself ever. And I've played a lot of sports in my life. I've never broken a bone, but like this is the worst pain I've probably ever been in. So I was a sophomore in high school and that this girl was having a Halloween party and she had a type of house where like the house was really nice, but the basement was was getting redone. So everything was cement, like under all the carpet was cement. So like she was in that stage of the rebuilding of her basement. So everything was like foundational, (laughs) foundational stuff. So it was like boards, like wooden beams and like cement everything. And she just had a basement party with like all of her friends. And she had the type of, she had the type of house where it was an old house. Like the stairs were like steep and long. Like it wasn't just like, a 20 you know 20 staircase like 20 step staircase it was like a 40 step staircase so like you had to like hang on to shit when you went down the stairs because if you fell off the side there's no railing because they're redoing it so it was just cement blocks and I remember getting really drunk that was probably the most drunk I've ever gotten in my life um I drank close to a whole handlebar of Tito's and I just remember walking down the stairs before I'd even like pre-gamed or anything like I'm going to hit my head on that later just like the door and I got I got really it, like sometimes like in when I would get drunk I would get like volatile like voluntarily angry and like run into shit punch holes in the wall like scream and shit so I was like mm, I'm gonna run down these stairs as fast as I can you don't run down the stairs you don't that's not how that works. Like, that's not how gravity works. Like, you go, you just tumble and fall downstairs. Like, so that's exactly what I did. But I'm in the doorway. I'm like, I'm going to run. And everyone's like, yeah, run, run, run. So I run. I hit my face straight into that wall when the stairs are going down. Like, you know, how, like, you know, how, like in Minecraft, really, like when you dig down, you have to like dig like a little thing in the wall so your head doesn't hit the wall. Well, there was that on the stairs and I hit my face so hard tumbled down the stairs there was a wall at the end of the stairs put a dent like in my face basically when I hit the end um I my cartilage piercing ripped out of my ear my nose was bleeding my face was bleeding I had a huge scar on my chin for months it was so ugly and I just like thinking back like someone said this today in in group and I was just like thinking back like you were like oh I was drunk like that's why I did that But, like, thinking back, like, oh, I was that drunk knowing, like, knowing that I could hurt myself that bad under the influence of anything makes me never want to be under the influence of anything ever again. Because there are times where, like, yeah, you can, you you can hurt yourself and, you know, you, you fall or, like, you know, whatever, you hurt yourself. But, like, to be consistently doing that on a weekly to daily basis is scary, that something could do that to you and that doesn't go for everybody who smokes and drinks like there are a lot of people who can balance this but I think the people who can balance it don't exactly have any underlying mental health issues and that might be a broad statement I will say that that might be a broad statement but I think the reason why I was so obsessively obsessed and addicted to drugs in itself is because of my BPD and because of my depression and anxiety anything that comes my way I'll just latch onto and that will become a routine of no matter whether it's good or bad um and I I kind of get envious of people sometimes who can and are able to balance a healthy life with being yo if somebody closes this door one more time I'm gonna be like hey um I kind of get envious of people who are able to balance it because I don't think I'll be ever able to drink or smoke or, you know, do any of that and live a normal life. I don't think I'll ever be able to, you know, go out and have a social drink without, you know, the next day turning into a binge of drinking episodes or, you know, falling back into that cycle of addiction, you know, and maybe that's for the best. And, and I say all the time, I'm so grateful for, you know, what's happened in my life and, you know, when it's happened and why it's happened, because I wouldn't be here sitting in front of this camera talking about it now if it didn't happen. But at the same time, 
I kind of fall victim of being envious of people who are able to live that quote unquote normal college experience and life without being addicted. Um, but I don't know. And then, and then I can contradict myself and be like, Hmm, would I really want to be going out to clubs and partying really hard and getting drunk with my friends? If I don't think I would even be happy because here's the thing about me and, and, pills specifically alcohol is a little bit different just because it was really accessible pills and I'm also writing my college one of my college thesis is on the morning the night that I almost overdosed and the morning that I got sober because those are really important days for me like there is no revelation before that of like oh I have a problem like I've always known I've had a problem there was no denial in that it was just a matter of getting help And helping myself more or less that I was in denial of. Like I I always knew like, yes, I am a functioning addict. Like I would joke around with my friends while I was in it. Like, yes, I am a functioning addict. Like I'm fully aware, which made me an extremely manipulative person because my mood swings plus the combination of, of drugs and alcohol just made me the worst insufferable person, person ever. Like I was just all over the place and what the fuck was I saying? Hmm. Sometimes, like that Michael Squ- Scott quote when he's like, sometimes I start a sentence and I don't know where the fuck it's going. Oh, so I'm writing that essay. So I, I basically go into full detail of what that was like. And I don't want to do that on a podcast because that might be a little bit triggering, honestly. But it it was really important to me because I finally, finally had that revelation of like, oh my god, my actions are affecting other people. Like, I, I, it sounds so fucked up that I never thought that before that point, but I genuinely didn't. Um, I remember my mom, she was out with her friends that night, and it was, it was, it was March, it was March 15th. And I'd gone out with my friend that night, and we went to the city actually we went out to the city and I met some of my friends and we drank a lot and we smoked a lot of weed and we were in a hotel room and I got home that night and I my dad had just recently gotten shoulder surgery or not that recently like he had just gotten shoulder surgery within six months of that time period and he had prescribed painkillers and I hadn't found them I don't think he hid them from me I just think that he didn't he's too macho of a man to use painkillers like he's like I remember my mom telling me one time when he got his tonsils out like he had a meatball sub like two hours later like after the doctor specifically telling him not to like he's just very much a person that I don't need that I'll, I can live on my own I'll be fine and that night I, I came in the train came in I went home and I was like, mm, I still feel I'm awake still. Like, I still need to, I need a little something. But I didn't want to drink and I didn't want to smoke because it was like, I just wasn't feeling it. And I reached into my my dad's drug cabinet. And there was that huge bottle of pills. And it was full. Like, he hadn't really used them. And I was like, jackpot. I was like, these are mine. Here, you're coming home with me. And I'm so Um, and I just remember being like, this is the best moment of my life. Like I, I've never felt joy like that. Just like, it felt like fucking Christmas. I was like, yes. Oh my God. Like, like I was just so excited and I, I don't want to go into full detail about how I did drugs, but I, I would snort them a lot and that's what I did. And I'd taken too much. I didn't even fucking read what was on the bottle. I just knew that they were painkillers and that they were going to get me fucked up. And I snorted a bunch of them. I crushed them up and snorted a bunch of them. And I fucking had a seizure. Like, which would have progressed to an overdose if I took a little bit more. I just remember... It it was a good... I don't want to say, like, it was the best feeling of my life, but that's why people do drugs. It was a great feeling it was a euphoric feeling it felt 
great for about a minute until it didn't and it started to feel bad and I started to feel cold and I started to feel like oh like I'm gonna die like it felt like I don't even know how to explain like what I am going to die feeling feels like but that's what it felt like it felt like someone had put me into an ice bath and I just felt pins and needles all over my face in my eye it felt like my eyes were burning it and it just turned really bad really fast and I don't even really remember anything past that point because I think I had just either blacked out and just my brain wasn't conscious for that period of time. And I remember my mom usually checks in on me the next morning, like at like six or seven or whenever she wakes up. And she didn't check on me that morning. She was blow drying her hair downstairs. And I woke up on the floor and my nose had been obviously bleeding because when I went like that there's dried blood all over my face and I just remember I'd never had a scare like that in my life before I remember like being like oh, I'm gonna throw up I'm gonna puke but I'd never been like oh I'm in danger of my life right now like this is like like I could have died um and I was on my back which scared the fuck out of me because I'd already been drinking. I was smoking. Then I did that. And I was on my back. Like I was literally sprawled out on the floor on my back. And I just remember waking up. And I don't even like know how to explain how, how I felt. But I just I just remember knowing that my mom hadn't checked on me yet. And she didn't. She even if she walked in at that moment while I was on the floor or like even if I'd gotten up and she walked in like she had no idea what had happened to me. And I wasn't even scared of getting caught in that moment. I was so scared of her feeling like she almost lost her child. That's what made me have that revelation of like what my mom would have felt if I died and she walked in and I was dead. That was my first push into sobriety because I was so selfish up until that point. Like, I don't care if my mom thinks I'm high or drunk. Like, it doesn't matter. But like dying is a whole other story of like that would my mom has dealt with so much in her life. She's lost a mother. She's lost a parent that's someone significant in her life. If she walked in and lost a child I don't even know, like, I can't even be like, I don't know what I would do with myself because I would be dead, but I would, I don't think there's any type of feeling that I can even begin to explain how that made me feel. It was sadness. It was shame. It was guilt. It was what the fuck am I doing with my life? I I just sat there for like a couple minutes and just breathed in sober air for the first time. Because I I totally, like, washed all of whatever the fuck was out of my body. You know, like, hours had gone by, so I was fully sober. And, you know, the first hours of the day were always the worst for me because, like, I I was sober. I had to go to school. Like, I never really went to school higher drunk, but it was when I got home. Like, that was when it was his prime hour. And I just, I, I looked into the mirror in my bathroom And for anybody who's gone through this experience, like whether that's weight loss or like having like the revelation of like, I need to change my life. I need to change something. I looked at myself in the mirror and suddenly I was 220 pounds. My hair was in the awkward phase of growing out. I had makeup on from the last night. I, my skin was bad. I'd gained so much weight. I had stretch marks on my hips and I just looked not like myself. Like, what you're seeing right now is cat, And I've honestly come pretty full circle in my life where, like, this is kind of similar to what I looked like when I was in middle school, in the beginning of high school. And to see someone in the mirror that didn't even look like me was scary because I had lived in such a manic form of living where, like, it was one thing to the next thing to the next consequence to the next consequence for my stupid actions where, like, I couldn't even comprehend, like, me as a person or what how people perceived me. I didn't care enough. I only cared about myself. And to see myself in the mirror and be like, who the fuck am I looking at was, like, I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. And for good reason, too. 
you know, I don't look back in, on that person and say, like, I hated that person and I'm embarrassed of that person. And I look back and just say, that wasn't me. That wasn't who I was. That was what drugs and a lot of bad shit in my life has made me. And, and, and a direct consequence of doing drugs, like not even like the drugs itself and the experiences and bad experiences that came from that. It was the people that it brought into my life. It was it was my behavior and how it impacted my parents and my family, how my family looked at me. I didn't realize it until that morning. And, you know, it sounds cheesy, but like that morning will stay with me for the rest of my life because I just, I never want to regress back to that moment. You know, I can regress, make mistakes, make a mistake like I did today, not mic checking yesterday to make sure that everything was together. I can regress in that way. But I never want to move backward so drastically where I ever get to that point again. You know, and that might be selfish. That might be like, "Mm, well, if you do, you have to be okay with that. There are certain things in my life that I will, I don't have a lot of regrets. But I do regret the way that I treated my parents and the person that I was for for a couple month period during that time. Because I ruined my life for a while and that you know that was drugs and alcohol and that was but it it was a direct cause from that um I can talk and sit here all day about how like kids bullied me and that's why I did drugs I did drugs because it was accessible and it was easy and it made me feel like I didn't have to live in the god-awful reality that I was um when I could have just changed it myself and realized that I had my own path that I could go down instead of you know whatever the fuck I was doing but I was young and I was a kid and I don't blame that version of myself for the things that have happened because without her I wouldn't be here and me but you know addiction's hard to talk about because on one hand you feel bad and on the other hand it's like "Mm, well you did this to yourself because I did there there's so many you know factors and you know paths I can go down and talk about right now but I'm just so happy that I did make it out because there are a lot of people that don't. There are a lot of people that don't even realize that they do have a problem. Um, I mean, just the sheer amount of people that I see on a biweekly to weekly basis in that AA room are just, you know, an example of how many people who do struggle with that. that I'm in New York City and that is a little church that that is just a fraction of how many people actually deal with this issue. And, you know, it might not always be the drugs and alcohol. It, like I said, like it could just honestly be like mental health issues or maybe they were conditioned by their parents. Like that's what I read today that in that story in the book about like how his brothers drank and his dad drank and that it wasn't this abnormal thing to like get fucked up every day. I never grew up around that, but I know people who have and are following in their parents' footsteps and see nothing wrong with it. Like that is addiction. And it's scary and you never want to be the person to you know make them aware of that they have to be aware of it themselves and then go on their own path it may take years it may take their whole life but they'll get there at some point and if they don't want to confront it that's their problem you you can't save anybody who deals with that issue and that's another thing I wanted to talk about today um if you know anybody or have a parent or or guardian or just somebody close to you in your life sorry (laughs) all you can do for them is just be a supportive figure in their life you know you, you can't save everybody you can't save people as much as you think that you can and you might have a really great impact on them there's nothing you can do all you can do is just be supportive and try your best to you know make sure that they're going in the right direction, but it sucks because I've had people that are really close to me in my life. Sorry, I just got to put my password in. How much time are we at? Ugh. Um, It sucks because I've had a lot of people close to me in my life feel like they could have helped me, and maybe they could have, but I think if my friends were the ones to get me out of it or my family... I think I would have relapsed by now. I had to figure it out by myself. And and that's a message for friends and family or 
that you know that struggle with this there's nobody in the world that can change them except for themselves and that's coming that's coming from somebody who struggled with addiction and alcoholism it somebody could say to your face i am never talking to you again you know until you stop drinking sorry i ran out of recording time um but yeah like i was saying like there's no person in the world that can change somebody fully because that's a broad statement but I've literally had friends you know from the age of 14 be like I can't be friends with you because you're drinking too much I can't be friends with you because you hang out with people that are actively hurting you and you are too smart to not see this and I've been like okay bye like childhood friends that I've grown up with be like yeah I'm done and me not caring because I chose I would choose alcohol and drugs over a friend or a family member. And that's horrible. So let's get into some things that can be helpful. Some things that that can help, you know, people out there who are struggling with addiction or struggling with a friend or family member who has addictions. Um, so, okay. So I think the things that helped me most were definitely a diet change. Um, drugs and alcohol can definitely, depends on the person, can definitely fluctuate your weight, you know, make your skin bad, just a mixture of everything. You know, watching what you eat is a very important thing, especially in recovery, because it helps you keep with that state of consistency, helps you look forward to somebody, look forward to something or look forward to doing something every day. The, the gym has helped me tremendously. Seeing, um, physical changes other than things I was inflicting on myself has been great and seeing a positive change every time has been great um art has been a tremendous thing too art painting drawing you know art not even in like the painting or you know drawing form like art in like writing creative writing um you know coming up with crazy ideas and actually ex executing them like manual like arts and crafts or like if you're a horrible painter learn how to paint or if you're a horrible writer start journaling just ugh, just stuff like that has been extremely helpful especially um, and I think focusing on yourself in the first year of sobriety is a really big one. Um, for me, at least, um, when you have that obsessive addictive behavior, you don't want to get sober and then turn that onto a person because that's kind of what I did. I have never dated anybody. I've never been in love, never been committed to a person only because I know myself. I know myself too well. If I get into a relationship, I will end up hurting them, end up cheating on them, end up doing something that's not good. In my first year of sobriety, I kind of hyper-focused on myself. And then the one person who actually showed me attention and understood my problem, I was like, I'm in love with you. Even though that I wasn't at all. I was just like, I love you. You know, you're my die all. Like, and me and that person don't even talk that much anymore. Nothing even happened. I just, I think it's, it's day and night in recovery. I, I think it's extremely important for you to stay single, for you not to hyper-focus on a relationship because it will come in the way of your sobriety and your, and your growth as a person. Because if you have other shit going on in your life, and especially a person, which is a complex thing to have on your, have going on in your life, you won't be able to focus on yourself as much as you can. You could be. Um, that may be drastic. That may be extreme. But, you know, from every single recovering addict, that's what I heard. Stay single in your first couple years or months into sobriety because it will just not work. You won't be able to give that other person what they need and it will affect your growth as a person. But, um, yeah, I told some pretty good stories today. Um, <laughs> today's a great day for me. I just I'm really mad about what happened with the other guest, but it's fine. Um, but yeah, today, today's been a great day, a great day to tell stories, a great day to reflect and um, look back on where I've come from and how far I've come as a person, as an artist. It's just, 
been really great. Um, and thank you for <laughs> being with me and everybody who still watches and listen and li- listens. Thank you. Um, because it's not easy to talk about this su- stuff sometimes and go through the work and not see results or numbers go up. It's, it's not easy. So I've been making this podcast since I was three months into my sobriety. And that's really weird to think about that people have watched me grow and hear me grow and know me as a person, even if they don't know me in the flesh. It just means a lot to me. So thank you. Um, but yeah, you can check out my website at Um I'll leave that link in the, uh, I'll leave that link in the description below. This will be on YouTube so you can watch me in the flesh and, um, yeah, I'll leave everything that you need to know about me in the link below, but I will see you guys in two Tuesdays and Elise will be on, um, the next time you see me. So thank you so much for listening and watching if you're watching and, um, I'll see you then. Bye.